Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. For almost a century, Farm Bureau has been a friend of the farm for all Virginians. Visit our website at vafb.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Here's what's coming up in this week's program. A Virginia County's FFA program is in the national spotlight. Chef Tammy has lamb sausage on the menu. And our popular county close-up series resumes with a look at Bedford County agriculture. Home will always be Virginia Between the Blue Ridge and Chesapeake Bay Atlantic to Appalachia Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from Chapel Creek Farms in Bedford County. We'll have more on agriculture here coming up later in our County Close-Up program. But first, a Virginia Middle School FFA chapter received top honors at the National FFA Convention last November. Elijah Griles reports on this significant achievement. What does it take to be the top middle school FFA chapter in the nation? Four Carroll County Middle School students answered that question at the National FFA Convention in Indianapolis last November. We had to wait the next day to find out, but I was telling them I already knew that our name was on the paper, already on the plaque. They didn't believe me, but I knew it. It was already there. Previously known as the Future Farmers of America, the National FFA organization is one of the top leadership programs in public schools. To win the National FFA Middle School Model of Excellence Award, the Carroll County students showed how they grow leaders, build communities, and strengthen agriculture in their chapter. FFA advisor Mackenzie Carter sees her students making an impact. Our community does what's called a lawn of hope, where businesses and individuals can decorate Christmas trees, um, on Main Street and people will bring canned food items and based on the number of ounces that's how many votes that tree has. It's a little fun competition but all the canned food goes to the blessing box in the town of Hillsville and then money for the trees goes to the American Cancer Society. We also did um, an FFA Fest this year where our students set up all of these events. They do cross-cut saw demonstrations and forestry events. Uh, we did pumpkin painting with younger kids, and our middle school students, they run the show. They do opening ceremony, they present, um, we had somebody present the FFA Creed this year, but they run the show and they include everybody in the community. Carroll County FFA advisor John Carpenter has been mentoring FFA members for almost 30 years and knew the challenges of winning at this elite level. So I think we would have been totally okay if we had got third place that day. But somehow it was just, again, all the stars lined up. And I think what shined, uh, shone through for us was all these girls had been in all these events. So when they were asked questions about them, it wasn't like a made up answer. It was. Like, our family did this. The National FFA Organization is a school-based youth development program with more than 945,000 student members. For Carrie Alderman, the trip to Indianapolis was a surreal experience. I thought it was amazing. I couldn't believe it. And I just never thought we would make it that far. So I was just really proud of our chapter. I was super surprised. I'd actually just got off stage going across for the Street Star Chapter Award. And then just hearing that, plus the three-star chapter award, it just felt like it wasn't really happening. And it was just meant a lot to me. Carroll County Farm Bureau President and middle school teacher Myra Leonard saw years of effort come to fruition on the national stage. And when they announced it, it was, it, it was just, it was a lifetime of work at our FFA chapter here. It was just the most exciting thing ever. Winning a national award was a peak for the chapter, but excitement and pride fill the halls of Carroll County Middle School every day. For Mackenzie Carter, the work of developing the next generation of leaders continues. I think it helps them figure out where they belong 
instead of figuring out that when you get to high school. They find their people here, they find out what they like, what competitions, um, how to interact with others, how to help others. Making a successful transition to high school is just a part of the journey. And these girls, I could not do it for them. And once you realize they really trained themselves for that contest because they were much beyond me being able to train them. And you know, as a teacher, when you get to that level, that you have truly taught somebody a life skill that they're always going to use. Megan Key feels FFA helped her hone her leadership skills as well as opened her eyes to a possible future career. I don't live on a farm, but when I first joined FFA, I was like, I can't do this. I don't live on a farm. And then Carpenter, he sat me down. He was like, you don't have to live on a farm. I was like, but it's agriculture based. And he was like, that means nothing. That's just what it's trying to get you into. You don't have to be from an agricultural based anything. You can be fresh out of the city and still join. Because Mr. Carpenter and Ms. Carter have inspired me so much. It's like, I just don't think that I can get away from it. Founded at Virginia Tech almost a century ago by four agricultural education teachers, the mission of FFA is to make a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. In the case of the Carroll County Middle School chapter, mission accomplished. From Carroll County, Virginia, I'm Elijah Griles, reporting. <music>In 1925, four prominent leaders in the field of vocational agriculture education began organizing the Future Farmers of Virginia. Much of their work at Virginia Tech was emulated in 1928 when the National Future Farmers of America was formed. In both cases, the goal was the same, to bring organization and structure to educational programs for young men planning to become full-time farmers. In 1935, the new Farmers of Virginia was organized, focused on helping black students follow the same career path. In 1965, the two organizations merged, and in 1969, girls were admitted to the FFA. In 1988, the name was changed to the National FFA Organization. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about drought damage to plants. Stay with us. Farming is a rewarding way of life, but it can also be full of challenges. If you or someone you know is struggling, Call or text the AgriStress Helpline at 833-897-2473. It offers 24-7 access to professionals who can support someone in need and help find mental health services in your community. Please make the call because healthy farms depend on healthy farm families. That's 833-897-2474. Droughts can take their toll on your landscape shrubs long after it starts raining again. Mark Viette shows us how to help them recover in the garden. Depending on where you live, you might experience lack of rain. And for example, this year, we're in what we call a severe drought and it may not happen again for a couple of years. But one of the plants that grows in nature is the dogwood. And this is Cornus, Florida, grows all the way from Florida to Canada. But you can see the damage to this dogwood because of lack of rain. Whole sections of the limbs have died. Might be a little bit of growth left here, but it's not going to survive much longer. In a minute, I'll show you where I irrigated dogwoods and they look great. I was fortunate enough to irrigate the gardens here around the house. And this dogwood, as you can see, still has great foliage, uh, maybe a branch here or there that has died back. But by irrigating dogwoods, uh, they look like this. Now, the number one leading problem of dogwoods is drought. 
Once you have a drought, your dogwoods are more susceptible to disease problems and other issues. So make sure you irrigate your dogwoods during dry conditions. Let's go look at drought damage to boxwoods. Rarely do I ever see drought damage occur in boxwood, but these boxwoods are planted in a very gravelly area. I was not able to irrigate this boxwood. So parts of the boxwood have died, as you can see here. Now, it, it sort of looks like uh, a disease, but when I really looked at it closely, I'm pretty sure it's drought damage, and you can see sections of the boxwood that are turning brown. That means it's a very severe drought. So what can you do about it? Well, really not anything now, except in the spring, the end of March, and we'll do a video on this, I'm going to cut this boxwood down to 24 inches from the ground. I really didn't want to do it because there's an unsightly trailer behind it. I may spray paint the trailer green, but all you can do during drought periods is irrigate your boxwoods. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Email your garden questions to Viet at Viet.com. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley. Coming up on Heart of the Home, homemade lamb sausage. We hope you'll stay with us. Every spring and fall, Virginia farmers and other motorists nearly collide on rural roads. Sometimes these collisions can be dangerous or even fatal when a car traveling 55 miles an hour suddenly meets much slower moving farm equipment. The odds of a collision shoot up. Farm equipment operators are required to display a slow moving vehicle emblem when they're on a public road. When you see that, slow down. Give them plenty of space to do their job. This message brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation Safety Advisory Committee. Lamb sausage. Just hearing that is probably making you hungry. Chef Tammy shows us how to make it in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen, and I'm here today to show you some delicious lamb sausage, homemade lamb sausage. I absolutely love using this recipe. We've got some ground lamb in a bowl and we've got some spices that we're gonna use. First thing I wanna show you is how to toast those spices. Whole spices always give you much more flavor than your um, already pre-ground. What I have in this little bowl here is some fennel seed and some cumin seed. I unfortunately did not have um, coriander seed, so I'm using ground, but you can still toast it. I have a skillet on the stove that is warming up. We're gonna pop, pop it into the skillet. Now what you might notice is there is no liquid in this skillet. You don't want it when you grind spices. You want a completely dry skillet. Pick up your hot skillet, move it around. You should start to smell it. Now this is an, uh, an, an African recipe. Um, it's also known as merguez. Um, I love using this recipe. It's also got some paprika and some cayenne pepper, a little salt. Um, some cilantro and some chopped garlic. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, we're going to form these into patties or you can do links. We're not using any sort of casing, but casing is um, an edible product that you could purchase from your local butcher if you wanted to do it in casing. But in this case, we're not using casing. <laughs> so we've got our toasted spices. But the thing of it is, is once you toast them, you're going to want to let them cool. And that's because we're going to be transferring them to a spice grinder. This is um, just a coffee bean grinder. I also use it as a spice grinder and I'm going to show you how to clean it after we grind our spices. So in a few moments we're going to put our cooled spices in the spice grinder. All right, our spices have now cooled somewhat and that's what you want. You really would not want to put a hot um, spice into the spice grinder because when you grind it it will cause condensation and that would cause um, a little bit more moisture than you need for the recipe. So we have a clean spice grinder and I'm gonna give you a little tip on how to clean it afterwards. But we're gonna go into our spice grinder or coffee bean grinder, whatever it's known as for you. 
these things are very inexpensive and I actually own two. I do one for coffee and one for spices. Doesn't take very long, but you just kind of want to move it around, depending on how much you have in the grinder. You can also hear it, and if it doesn't sound like it's, um, I don't know, rough, I guess, so to speak, it sounds smooth, and this does. So we're going to take the spices and, yep, it's perfect, absolutely. So we have a nice ground fennel and cumin and some coriander. We're going to add that to our sausage, or our lamb, I should say, ground lamb. Now, how to clean these things. Very, very easy to do. Um, some plain, simple rice. We're going to pop it into the grinder. You're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to grind the rice. A couple of minutes on that, or a couple of seconds, I should say. You can empty the rice out into your trash can, and you have a perfectly clean grinder to do whatever next you do, whether it be coffee beans or spices. So back to the lamb. We've got our spices in here. Now we're going to add some cumin and um, paprika. Your recipe says paprika. I like to use smoked paprika for sausages. And we have some salt. Put that in there. And we've got a couple tablespoons of cilantro. And I do know that there's some cilantro aversions out there. And that's okay. I know you can't help it. Um, it's all right if you want to substitute parsley or if you want to leave it out completely, that's all right as well. So we're going to add some minced garlic that I had on my board here and some chopped cilantro. Now I am going to go ahead and glove up for this um, just because it's a little easier and less messy. And all we're going to do now, very, very simple, is we're going to make patties out of this. We're going to mix all this up together. Got some nice pretty green color in this. And now it depends on, you know, what sort of shapes you're interested in. Do you want round? Do you want long? Do you want cylinders? It's really up to you. I think we're just going to do a couple of round ones. It'd be a little easier. I've already got my pan warming up on the stove over there. I'm going to pat it out sort of like a meatball to a certain extent. And then we're going to flatten it. You could do it this way. Set, have it ready and waiting for you to start cooking. If you are more interested in cylinders, that is totally fine as well. Just make it longer, like a sausage normally would be. I'll do one more. I kind of like the, uh, the cylinder. So it depends on you. It's a preference. You know, I like to tell people that there are no recipe police that are going to come knock on your door and arrest you for not following the recipe. So it's, uh, cooking is based on your likes and dislikes. So we've got a couple of nice cylinders. This one is a little fat, to be honest, so I think that would take a little longer to cook, so I'm going to break it off a little bit. <clears throat> Remember that something bigger always takes longer to cook than something smaller. Now, this is more uniform with the other cylinder that I made. We'll let that be there. Maybe we'll do one more patty, and then we're going to start cooking. Now, we have a hot pan over here. You know, you can put 10 different chefs in the room and get 10 different ways on how to warm up things. And I personally, my, my main rule of thumb when it comes to pans and fats is do not put a product in a cold fat. That is absolutely the worst thing you could do. The other thing about th uh, cooking is if I had a huge skillet and it tells me a teaspoon of oil, well, is that going to be enough to cover the bottom? It's probably not. So you, depending on the size skillet will depend on how much oil or fat that you choose to use. Now we have got um, some oil in the bottom of the pan here. It's already translucent in nature, which is what you want. When you're warming it up, what I would not want to do, as I mentioned, is put fat or product, excuse me, in a cold fat. So we're going to sear these off. Looking for a nice sound there, and that was perfect. We're going to sear them off until they get a nice little brown caramelization on them, and then we're going to finish them off in a 425 degree oven. You could do the entire cooking process on top. That would be fine. I tend to think that takes a little bit longer. And so what we're going to do is finish them off in the oven. Excuse me one second, get the right skillet here, right spatula. Now the other thing is that while they are in the hot fat here, you don't want to start trying to flip them immediately. You want them to sort of release on their own. So I'm not going to flip these right away. And once they have a nice little caramelization on um, pretty much all sides, then we're going to finish them off in the oven. All right, so our lamb sausage has been in the oven for about 10 minutes. I did it on 425 degrees. We're going to pull it out. You 
You always want to make sure when you pull the skillet out of the oven that you keep a hot pad close by. I can't tell you how many times I've tossed it either back where it goes or off to the side, and then I go and reach for the skillet and I've burned my hand. Um, that is experience talking. You don't want to do that. So we've got this delicious lamb sausage. We're going to take it out and put it on our serving dish. I actually have done this before where I've grilled the lamb sausage on the grill and I will split it open and fill it with feta cheese and continue the grilling process. Absolutely delicious. So there we have it, lamb sausage. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. There are more than 82,000 sheep and lambs in Virginia, raised on 2,311 farms. Most flocks are small, under 100 head. The total value of Virginia sheep sold in 2022 was $8.9 million. In the first half of the 20th century, wool was a valuable market for sheep farmers, but as man-made materials became popular with consumers, demand for real wool declined dramatically. The total income from wool sales in the Old Dominion in 2022 was $78,000. Sheep are commonly raised in the mountains of western and southwestern Virginia, but are becoming more popular statewide as consumer demand for lamb grows. Located in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Bedford County is home to the National D-Day Memorial. It's here because on D-Day, this community suffered the greatest number of casualties per capita. Those who were lost are now known as the Bedford Boys, and many of them grew up in agriculture. And agriculture remains the dominant way of life in Bedford 80 years later. Most producers today raise beef cattle like Steve McFadden. His 480-acre farm has been in the family since 1792. He says Bedford's geography is well-suited to raising livestock. We've got woods, we've got fields, we've got pastures, we've got some of the best hay fields here in the county. And it's just, there's always been animals on the farm. Bedford is located between Roanoke and Lynchburg, two fast-growing communities. The county also has tourists who visit Smith Mountain Lake in the southern end of Bedford County. Farmers here have had to adapt. We're kind of always fighting the challenges that come along with having um, the tourism from the lake and then the um, sprawl from those um, city areas. But um, you know, agriculture has always been here. I think agriculture will always be here. Um, and will continue to be the largest industry in the county. It gets windy in Bedford County with its proximity to the Blue Ridge Mountains, but that actually helps prevent frost as the season turns from winter to spring. W.P. Johnson farms full-time and works another job. He's lived in Bedford all his life and raises grain crops as well as cattle. We're a heavy red clay. Um, brick plant is here in the county as well, uh, right on the edge of it actually. Um, so we're used to red clays, uh, hard bricks. We do a lot of small grains. That's a primarily across the county. We, wheat and barley and oats seem to be the big tank. Another big thing in the county is the direct sales trend that has become popular with beef producers. Melody and John Divers operate Chapel Creek Farm and say retail sales are an important part of their bottom line. We sell direct to consumer owned cattle and we still finish out stockers too that we ship straight to feed lots. Um, Currently we're running somewhere around 300 brood cows. Total head together we have some roughly 900 head counting their fats, bred heifers, and new crop of calves coming on. Beef is their main product now, but the divers farm operation started by selling cider. Melody Divers also leads an ag advisory group dedicated to advancing the cause of local farming. Advocate for the farmer to educate the community about what is in, available in the ag community in Bedford. Um, we have board of supervisors that attend, we have economics department, so it's really the whole gamut of everyone invested in ag. Bedford County has 183,200 acres in farmland, according to the 2022 Census of Agriculture. The county is ranked number one in terms of hay, with 41,060 acres. Cattle and calves bring in the most money, however, at $14,309,000. Hay is a distant second at $5,446,000.
Nurseries and greenhouses are at $2,819,000, while grains such as corn, wheat, and soybeans deliver $2,000,000. $401,000. Keith Tuck and his son Andrew are cattle producers in the southern end of Bedford County, just north of Smith Mountain Lake. Tuck Farms just won the region's Environmental Stewardship Award. With help from the local Soil and Water Conservation District and the National Resource Conservation Service, Tuck installed fencing to exclude his cattle from the ponds and streams on the farm. They also established a water system that allowed for rotational grazing. The soil on his farm has improved, and he uses less fertilizer. Tuck says the award recognizes more than just what they've done on the farm. It's what you do a lot in the community. You know, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I've spoke all around the state. I've spoke out of state. A lot of uh, college and high school classes I've spoken to in the ag industry uh, about what I'm doing, trying to make raising cattle more sustainable. Ronnie Gross is another Bedford County producer who has taken advantage of direct marketing. They have a large storefront as well as a pick your own operation. For him, direct marketing is in the family bloodline. We've always been in the retail market business uh, for a number of generations, but my great grandfather hauled apples to Lynchburg by wagon. It was a three day affair. He would go down one day, sell one day and return the next day. So. We've been direct marketing since that time. The people of Bedford County have reason to be proud of their history, but they're not resting on it. They know they're situated between two metropolitan centers, and that will bring pressure for new development, but also new customers. In Bedford, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we're proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. farmers for just the produce and so we can eat fresh and clean and um, so we can stay healthy. But we are so blessed to have farmers and farmers who care and so I just want to say thank you. Thank you farmers! Thank you farmers! We love farmers! Thank you so much farmers for providing all our food to help us survive. Tomatoes, peppers, and strawberries. I want to be a farmer when I grow up. Thank you farmers!